next on the agenda, we'd like to hear from our student council rep, Nicole St. Jean. It's all yours, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Okay, so first up, I have sports. Um, fall sports are now over except football. Um, everyone wrapped it up, and now captain's practices for winter sports have begun. But our fall field hockey, varsity field hockey team, made it to the districts. They won their first game, but they unfortunately lost the second game. But good job to them and a great season they had. And the cheerleading team went to regionals this past weekend with their brandy new uniforms that they love and talk about all the time. So, um, and they did very well there. And football won their game against Quaybog last Friday night. Um, next Thursday, we'll be hosting the Thanksgiving game, Go Pirates, at 10 a.m. here at the Oxford High football field. Um, and before that, before the game, the operation graduation is having a breakfast in the cafeteria. So that's open to the public, anyone that wants to come. Um, for the student council today, we held our first blood drive of the year, and we'll be having a second one sometime in the spring. Um, I don't have the results of that, obviously. It was from today, but it went very well. We had a lot of kids come, a lot of teachers come down, too. Um, so overall, it was a success. Um, for the, We started our third annual turkey run a couple weeks ago. Various clubs like NHS, student council, um, and then each department, the math, science, foreign language, all those kind of departments each do a basket. I know you guys do a basket. The central office does a basket. Um, last year we raised, we did 46 baskets, I believe, and we're hoping to even top that this year. Um, so it goes to local families in need that need a Thanksgiving dinner. It's a great cause, so we're all excited to do it. From the National Honor Society, our Sadie Hawkins dance is this Friday at 7 p.m. in the cafeteria. Um, Pre-sale tickets are on sale now for $7, and tickets at the door will be $10. Um, and also, the National Honor Society is working with Bigwood Insurance, and they'll be putting together care packages for soldiers overseas um, for part of their community service, and that's a great thing to get involved with, too. We've never done that before. This is something new, so good job, Ms. Klimczak. She's introducing new things to the National Honor Society. Um, the school store website is up and running. Thank you to Mrs. Patricia Spitz. Um, she got that underway. Our school store is open during lunches. We have a booth outside for games. Um, and now we have our own website. So if you go on, you can look at that. Look at our all new uh, merchandise. It's pretty schnazzy. Um, next Wednesday, before the Thanksgiving Day game, I think that's the 23rd, 24th, that Wednesday. Um, from 6 to 9, they are holding a bonfire um, over on the field near the, be the baseball field, and the rocket's already in the front lobby. So to get everyone pepped up and ready to go for the next morning's game. Um, OK, now the ROTC report. They covered the Veterans Day Parade and handed out over 100 carnations to veterans that um, shed a couple tears, which was nice and they supported um, at two veterans dinners. Their first drill meet was Saturday in Rhode Island and they won five trophies out of eight events. They came in first two times, second twice, and third once. So good job to them. And their next meet is December 11th in Newport, Rhode Island at Rogers High School. They will be involved in the bandstand, the tree lighting of, I mean the lighting of the tree. Mm -hmm. They'll be the live nativity scene. Um, and they had a very successful Navy inspection a couple weeks ago. Everything was positive. Um, the best comment, this is straight from Commander Maisley, was the big head honcho from Philadelphia said if he could clone the Oxford kids in the way that we run our ROTC program, he would, and he would put it in, their, in his own schools. So um, Commander Maisley said that was one of the best comments he'd ever gotten. And they're doing a massive color guard for Thanksgiving, trying something new that we'll all be surprised with, he said. So I'm anxious to see what he has in store. And also at that inspection, he, the inspector allowed Commander Maisley to hand out twice as many awards than usual. He handed out 16 awards. And of all the freshmen, at least 23 got outstanding, which is really rare. So, um, and he personally thanks all of you for that night. <coughs> And that's uh, all I have. Very good, Nicole. Thank you so much, as always. Um, with the committee's permission, I'd like to move the discussion of the dropout rates to next on the agenda, if everyone finds that acceptable. Mm -hmm. And if we could have Mr. Wells come up. You're going to be making the presentation, I understand, with our superintendent. 
So whoever would like to start? Mr. Wells, he just put you right in the hot seat, right off the staff. Well, thank you, Mr. Spitz. Exceptionally difficult act to follow. Nicole St. Jean is uh, <laughs> exceptionally well-versed. We're very proud of her as a senior at Oxford High School. Uh, each and every one of you, I'm sure, in your original packet, I believe you got last Friday, should have a beautiful cover uh, that came from our digital design program upstairs of Oxford High School, primetime foliage. Um, and that's just to show you a little bit of what we're doing upstairs. The meat and potatoes is just behind that. Uh, what I've been asked to do, I believe, is to capsulate programs and activities that Oxford High School uh, has done and is currently doing to assist in decreasing the number of dropouts at Oxford High School. Uh, upon arrival at Oxford High School, as you can see with the mental health counseling, uh, with your blessings, I was able to uh, make a connection with Community Health Link. So we have a mental health counselor on staff here at Oxford High School. It's a third party payment. Consequently, parents that have difficulty with transportation and getting their children to uh, the town of Webster or Worcester or Westboro, uh, they no longer have to do that. Uh, the referral process comes from teachers to guidance, from guidance uh, we move it on to uh, community, uh, I'm sorry, to Community Health Link and uh, they begin their counseling. It's been very effective and uh, I would have to say it's successful from this standpoint. Uh, the numbers are increasing, which means the students that need mental health counseling are being provided the opportunity to gain it here during an academic lab and it certainly helps them, it helps the family, and most importantly, it helps them to function as an active student at Oxford High School. Our MCAS tutoring, students that fall in a needs improvement or failure category, we continue to provide uh, MCAS tutoring, individual tutoring for them, and those students that have failed MCAS after their sophomore year, uh, remediation continues so that they can prepare to take the exam in the retake during their junior year. Uh, they can take it up to twice during their junior year. Uh, next, last year we began a school to career program. Uh, the harsh reality of education forever has been that not all students are college bound, not all students are bound for the military. Some students want to get into the workforce and so hoping to provide them that opportunity to give them a caveat or a carrot um, to keep them engaged in their academics Mr. Sikonsky has been working in guidance to try to get job placements uh, out in the community. We'll be looking also for externships where students would go and not be paid, but they can gain the experience of working firsthand uh, in the private sector. And we're hoping that that will engage some of those students uh, that would look forward to leaving school and essentially getting dual credit. They'd be getting paid, on uh, one side would be getting paid, if they do an externship, they would uh, be gaining the experience without getting paid, but either way, they'd be getting high school credit. So it will help them toward their graduation. This year, for the first time, uh, we had identified in my first two years uh, that we had a regular education population of students that, uh, that struggled in their academics. They were bright enough not to be placed on an IEP or an individual education plan, yet they needed uh, more support and more assistance. Consequently, we uh, have four teachers that had volunteered. They do an excellent job. We have one, uh, one tutor that rotates, or a teacher's aide, that rotates to all four classes with this small group of students. Right now, I believe total enrollment is about 10. So it's a 10 to 1 ratio. They're students that struggle academically. They've been identified because of previous failures, and we're hoping that they will find some success. Additionally, uh, oftentimes when you find students that are disruptive, when they're disruptive in a class of 25, if we use that as a mean number, uh, that takes away from the other 23 or 24, depending on how many of those students feed off of each other. So sometimes uh, it impacts an, a, a much larger population than just those students that have difficulty focusing. So at this point in time, it's very early. It seems after the first marking period to be uh, quite successful. And uh, I certainly will keep you apprised of how that's doing in the future. Also, uh, since my arrival, we started an online credit recovery program. 
Uh, oftentimes, over the course of my career, I found that many students come into high schools, and especially in grade nine, but also sometimes in grade 10, it takes a little bit of an adjustment period before they say, this really counts, and it's time to get my act together. Oftentimes what happens is students that fail classes, either in their freshman and or sophomore year, find that they're behind the eight ball, and they recognize the fact that their peers are gonna be graduating, and they're not going to be. Our credit recovery program provides them an opportunity to go online and uh, to work on the computer to regain some of their academic credit. Primarily, uh, the students that need it focus on English and math. Um, it's self-paced, it's very intense. Uh, we do provide a tutor to assist them during that uh, time frame. So it's just another way to try to provide them a little bit of a boost, a safety net, to help them to graduate. Uh, this year, for the first time in many, many moons, uh, we have eliminated Saturday school, and we've gone to in-school suspension. So I don't want to say that it is the dungeon, uh, but the students are given their academic work. They are uh, with a professional staff member all seven periods of the day. They eat a separate lunch, so they're not in the social mainstream. And quite frankly, oftentimes students' uh, socialization is really important to them. So we're hoping that we uh, provide them the support that they need, but not any of the perks or benefits of being with their friends so that they don't want to go back to in-school suspension. Uh, thus far, the numbers haven't been extraordinary, but uh, I believe that the message is, is pretty clear and concise to all the kids that are going to in-school suspension. Uh, I have received some comments from parents that they are grateful because of today's economy. Most parents are both working, and consequently, the child's at home unsupervised and alone, uh, where in school they're expected to be here and uh, do their work. Summer tuition school waivers and payment plans. Uh, Mr. Nugent, uh, the assistant principal at the high school, who's the summer school coordinator and director, uh, thought that this would be a creative way to eliminate excuses. So students that, uh, that can't afford to go to summer school uh, based on their income through uh, free and reduced lunches, are afforded the opportunity to come uh, without pay. Others are able to make payments during the course of the uh, entire summer, so that it's, it's an installment plan or a payment plan, and that's worked out relatively well. Uh, student course level changes, uh, even up to, through, and including the first quarter. Guidance counselors, uh, along with teachers recommendations we'll take a look at how the students are doing in class why they're not doing well if they're not doing well and are they placed appropriately so because we have four levels at oxford high school advanced placement honors college prep and career oftentimes we will uh, move a student from an honors class to a college prep class so that they can uh, be a little bit more successful uh, it's not as tenacious uh, or intense in the classroom and consequently, they have a better survival rate, if you will, in terms of passing. Uh, this year, uh, one of the, I guess one of the points that I'd like to make is that I believe with all my heart that when students are engaged and they find a purpose, uh, when they're struggling, looking for things to do in school, and, and again, uh, the, the four R's, if you will, or the three R's, uh, are not their primary focus. If we can find a way to capture or captivate them, I think it'll give them a reason to be in school and to stay in school. Consequently, we have several people that have volunteered to run different clubs to try to engage students after school. You can see the Rocket Club, Guitar Hero, Photography Club, a chess club, Creative Writing Club. We have a stomp team. If any of you would like to stop, uh, stop by and make a guest appearance, uh, we would love to have you. Uh, but it's, it's something that uh, Patty Ross is uh, kind of volunteering to coordinate and Danielle White is helping her do that. Kids are having fun. They are going to make their debut. I believe it's next Monday night. Uh, Nicole didn't say that, but we have a Best Buddies basketball game, so they want to make their debut at the Best Buddies basketball game. And uh, I also asked her not to say too much because I don't want to embarrass myself. I did volunteer to play, and I think my better days have gone by me. <laughs> so those are the programs that we currently uh, have in place. In addition, uh, two weeks ago I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Marie Beachman. She's the assistant property manager at Orchard Hill. 
Marie is a real live wire. She's got a great pulse on kids. Uh, she runs a youth group uh, at Orchard Hill. She also has been working with Catholic Charities and Daniel Morrow to try to put together uh, a GED program. I also, that same day, had an opportunity to meet with uh, her name has escaped me. It's not Renee. Uh, the woman that runs the adult learning program for the town of Webster Public Schools. So she shared with me how they go about their GED program as I was looking to try to reach out to see if there was some way that we could provide assistance for students that were bound, determined, and determined to try to get their GED. Because oftentimes when you look at the dropout rate, how students are recorded is really paramount. And if a student gets their GED within the first year of when they're listed as a dropout, if I make a phone call to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they'll remove that name. And trust me, th that is the case in some of these instances for sure. Uh, also, uh, you have before you, it's called Your Plan for College. Uh, Commissioner uh, Mitchell Chester uh, has a program now that is free, that Oxford High School is going to take full advantage. That's a two-page paper with, at the top, it's listed the Commonwealth of Mass Executive Office of Education. Uh, the new portal, uh, which is free, once again, to students, families, and high schools, provides a robust online resources and tools to assist students and parents to learn about and prepare for college and careers, not just college. So uh, it's a great opportunity, and again, we're trying to take advantage of that. Uh, this coming Wednesday, I have a meeting with Kathleen Radley, a representative from Quinsigamond Community College. What I'm hoping to do is to entice, coerce, uh, whatever descriptive adjective you'd like to use, her to allow Oxford High School to be a site for an after-school uh, credit recovery program through Quinsigamond Community College. My colleagues, I meet once a month with the Southern West County League principals. Every school essentially has the same issues, and we all do battle you know, with, with the same type of demons when it comes to dropout. Consequently, if we had an area or a place like Oxford High School where a student could take intro to uh, literature or an intro to algebra, college level course, intro to college level course, after school hours, they can use it as dual credit. If they pay for the course, they would receive three credits from Quinsigamond Community College. Simultaneously, they would be able to make up credits that they lost in previous years of their high school career. And again, it's, it's trying to put them and push them on place. We've tried to think out of the box, uh, one, one, a little bit more so. One keen and fine example of that is I have a young man, uh, Chief Sherry Bemis from the fire department is a, is a good friend of mine. Uh, very rigid, I might add, when it comes to uh, incorporating any type of curriculum. We have a young man that uh, is a senior that was struggling, and, uh, but he never struggled when he worked at the fire department, and he never struggled going to training all summer long uh, in the Central Mass Training Institute. So consequently, I'm able to combine with Sherry uh, to, to help him to get some, I guess you would call it fire science, a fire science course. And she is the founder, the developer, the designer, if you will, and she keeps track of it. Uh, Mr. Ward goes down and meets with her periodically, and uh, the young man is doing pretty well. So it's just another way. But what I would like to say is that oftentimes students uh, that come to Oxford High School aren't necessarily students that were born, brought up, and have come through Oxford for all the years. So when you look at the numbers, and I'd be more than happy to, without keeping the, co the names obviously confidential, go through a large number of students that have moved into town or have been placed here by DCF. And uh, consequently, if they're in DCF, the uh, Children and Family Services Department, once they turn 18, they become their own guardian, even with DCF. And consequently, a lot of those kids uh, will choose not to come back to school. If a student registers 
at Oxford High School or any high school and their SASID number is put into the program and they're now a registered student, after day one, if they choose not to come back, they're listed as a dropout. We had a student that moved back to China, was listed as a dropout. So quite frankly, uh, I've been educating myself on the intricacies of how to record students through DESE. Uh, most assuredly, I can tell you that the numbers that you saw this year will not be replicated again last year. Uh, certainly, they'll all be legitimate, but I, we will know more of how they should be recorded, comparatively speaking, to years gone by. Are there any questions regarding dropout prevention? I do have a couple other things that I just wanted to touch base on. Well, I just wanted to mention one thing to you, if I could, Mr. Wells. First sure. of all, um, I really, truly appreciate you jumping on this. Um, this has been really a main focus for me since I've been on the committee. Um, each year it presents itself as a problem to the town. Um, and I really appreciate the way you've responded to, to really the committee's desire to see this improve. And I, I think that with some of the things that you have in place, that you've put in place since you've become the principal, um, I think some of these are very solid plans, and I think that they will help to improve the dropout rate. It might not be substantially, but I think it will. And if we can save two or three students from that list to graduate, well, then we've all done our jobs. I mean, I, I think that we really have to be looking at each student individually to, to find out whether we're successful or not. And I want to thank you for eliminating Saturday school. I never agreed with that program. I thought it was a waste of time. Um, it actually proved to be a benefit to most of the students because if they didn't show up for Saturday school, then they got suspended for Monday. So they, they just got like a three or four day weekend and it, it really just, it did not have the impact, I think, on, on what we intended it to be. So thank you so much for doing that. That was a big step, I think. And I think you're right. And I think it is showing students that we're serious about the way they behave in our schools. Um, and, and I think that gives us a control method that we can actually track them now um, more efficiently than we could have through the Saturday school program. So I think that that's going to be a big win for you. Um, and all the others, too. I, I think you've really done an outstanding job putting this together, and I really appreciate your time and effort on it. Um, so any, anything from the committee? Mr. Peterson. As a whole, I agree with Mr. Spitz, Mr. Wells. You've done a great job in trying to motivate the students to get back in here. I have a little different perspective on Saturday school, and I don't disagree with you totally. The reason for Saturday school being implemented was because in-house suspension became a screw-off. If I didn't want to go to class, I just screwed off, and I wound up in in-house suspension. So some ramification had to be presented so that they wouldn't just keep going to in-house suspension. But it looks to me like you've turned the in-house or in-school suspension to a different type program where it's more educational than just a babysitting program that it was at one time. So I'm, I'm willing to live with this and see how this goes because that seems to be cyclical. So good luck with it. And the school to career, um, I think, I don't know if Mr. Skonsky was here when Henry Hamlin was, but you were, I believe. And we had the work study. We're, let's tread lightly. We're dating ourselves a little bit, I know Mr. That, Peterson. Mr. Wells, I'm sorry, but we did have a work study <laughs> program, and why it went by the wayside, I don't know. I really appreciate bringing this back. My only question is, what are the hours of this? Are they taking a full class load, then leaving like at noon or something, to their jobs or whatever? Like, exactly. In order to make it, uh, with the rotating schedule at Oxford High School as it currently exists, the lunch period, which is the next to the last period of the day, is a frozen period. The other six periods rotate every single day. So the teachers don't have the same students, the same period, the same time every single day. And the agreement that I have with the uh, faculty, and it's worked out because again, I have to be honest, I believe in, in participatory management and allowing them to partake in the decision-making process. They suggested, because I wanted to freeze that last block, they suggested that, uh, what if we allowed the students to make up the work and we gave them the extra time to do that? So uh, to this point in time, that's what we've done. Uh, when you look at school to career, and if you use 500 as a, a round figure of number of students, uh, more often than not, and speaking to my colleagues, for 20 kids, and in this building certainly less than that, it drives their schedule by locking those last two blocks. We're going to be looking, we're in the process of looking to be creative uh, with a little change of the schedule, which should come to you a little later this year uh, for next year um, to try to decrease academic labs. 
um, I, I kind of was spoiled at, when I, in my previous assignment because we had a block schedule and there were no academic labs. So we're looking at that. But uh, right now, the work study for those students that uh, have the opportunity, it seems to be working out pretty well. We'd like to get more community involvement. We'd like to get, and we're trying to reach out a little bit more. So I'm going to free Mr. Skonsky up to actually start to do some cold calls at some of the businesses uh, in the town of Oxford. I appreciate that because I think that it, it also helps them manage their time. It gives them a full day as well as just hanging around study halls or something at the same point in time. So I'd like to see that a little later on how it's progressing because I, I think it'd be a great Great job again. I'm just disappointed to see that disappear before. On your summer tuition waivers and payments, who's, uh, how is that paid for? Who picks up the, is that coming out of our budget for teachers and things? Well, what happens is any surplus from summer school. I know it's not self-supporting, but. Right, so any surplus would go back into, back into when it. it comes to surplus, goes into, I believe, the general account. But uh, what we do is those students that have free and reduced lunch, we provide them the opportunity. And quite frankly, it's not a large number that take advantage of that. Most of the students do pay, uh, but also having the extended pay and the payment plan has worked out pretty well. So it really doesn't cost us, if that makes sense. Okay. If I may, Mr. Spitz. Continue. Uh, I was, I'm curious on the fire, fire course. I think that's great. Um, is this an accredited course that someone gets credit for then in the science field? or? Is this an elective? We're, we're an going as an independent study. We're going to provide this particular youngster through Sherry Bemis, the chief fire chief in Oxford, uh, credit for one course. Okay. So that it's, it's, when you talk about accredited, it's not through the National you know, Fire Safety Association or anything like that. Uh, it is through the Oxford Fire Department and Sherry Bemis. And I think it's, it's a... And that course is taken there or on our premises? No, it's taken there. It's taken there. Right. So very similar to work study, that student goes down, does an externship, and at the same time does, uh, gets credit for uh, fire science. I think that's great. I hope you can find a couple other courses of the same nature that you can work into it then. Seems to be one of the major attractions for this particular individual. You know, obviously you've got to be careful, and, and I certainly wouldn't have... So it's uh, a student-by-student student base. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Thank okay, you. thank you. Hey, hey, Mrs. Ennis? How many students right now are you looking at that are in that kind of um, danger area for possible dropout that you're working with? It's, it's very, very difficult to say. And the reason I say that is because we have a freshman class that we're just starting to get to know them a little bit. Uh, when you look at grades 10, 11, and 12, I, and this is a guesstimate, so please don't hold me to it. I could get you much uh, closer numbers. But I would have to say there are probably 15, ballpark figure, number of students. and, and you, and in all honesty, there's a multitude of reasons that I certainly wouldn't go into in an open session, right. but there's a multitude of reasons, one of which is, is the re rationalization of bringing mental health counseling. Not that Ward and June Cleaver are not alive and well in many homes and communities, but the hard fact of the matter is there are some parents that are working really, really hard in single parent homes and it's very, very difficult to work sometimes 10 hour days and then go home and have you done your homework when it's, there, there's a lot of factors, there's an awful lot of factors uh, that go into what one might say is uh, the emotional fragility mm -hmm. of a lot of these kids. Yeah, well I think that we can appreciate that none of this is cookie cutter of course. The mental health counseling here that um, we, we have at this school, how often is this offered? How often? I have to be honest, we had a, uh, well, actually, it's all based on a number of, we'll say, clients. Yeah. So uh, the woman that has been doing it uh, has been coming in two days a week. Okay. Just had a tragedy in her family, lost her husband very unexpectedly at a very, very young age. Okay and uh, she hasn't returned. So I have a meeting with them tomorrow so that we can get uh, someone in uh, as a replacement for a short-term, hopefully, stopgap measure. Sure, sure. But when she, before she went out, 
she was coming in two days a week. Okay. And when I was at David Prouty, just a point of information, it had, uh, there were minimum four days a week after the program had developed over uh, an extended period of time. Uh, and just on to the summer school, if we could. Yes. Did you, where you say that it, you know, the waivers for the fee and everything, um, did the rationale, did that work? That people would say, you know, I can't afford it or I can't do this. So my child or my, you know, my son, my daughter isn't going to be able to make summer school. In a perfect world, it worked like a charm. But the harsh reality is, is even though you eliminate that excuse and, and the mom or mom and dad really want that individual student to go to summer school, yeah. they're 16 years old and I don't want to go to summer school. They can pay me and I'm not going to go to summer school. So again, it, it's a part of the dynamics that are there mm. that add to the reason why kids drop out of school to begin with. Mm. So um, it doesn't always work, no. It eliminates the excuse that I can't afford it. But what it does is it, it then allows us to take a look and say, you can lead a horse to water, you just can't make them drink. Right. I can make a student sit in class. I can't necessarily make them, you know, even through osmosis, learn what's going on in the math class. Yeah. So. Are the parents, when you speak to them, are they receptive or, I mean, or guardian, whatever the situation may be for that student? I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I've said it a million times, I'll probably say it a million more, that the parental involvement or, or guardian, whoever it is that's raising the child, there has to be that connection with the school, with the principal. And if you're having a child that's, you know, in danger of becoming a dropout or just saying, I'm not going to do this, how do you engage that parent? Because sometimes that, that might be that missing link is the parent doesn't necessarily push or show that student the way that some of us may show our children, you know, lead them into that direction. So how, how do you, I guess, either conquer it if you can? If you, if you can't conquer it, what do you do? What do you do when a parent just doesn't want to engage? Well, again, all we can do is provide the opportunities. Uh, today I had a meeting with a parent, um, a mom and stepdad and uh, an individual student. Mm -hmm. And uh, mom assured me there would never be any issues any further. When I had a very open discussion regarding the individual's future, uh, they said, I don't know if I want to uh, get a high school diploma. And of course, the parents say, oh, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. The bottom line, again, is horse, water. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to dynamics, but the dynamics of, of the home they're, they're all so different yeah. in, in all of our homes. And consequently, how your daughter responds may not be the way that my son responds. Right. Right. And how your home is run may not be the way my home is run. And maybe you have dinner every night and we use the microwave every night. There's a multitude of factors. Um, but to answer your question, I find that a large number of parents when students come in because of a suspension primarily, mm -hmm. parents are very supportive, top to bottom are very supportive. That doesn't mean that the child is going to be responsive. Exactly, yeah, right. So parents are supportive. When we have parent nights and, and, as, and as teachers throughout this district and every district across the country, you're preaching to the choir for the most part. Mm -hmm. You understand, you know, your argument is, why did my daughter get a 92 when maybe she should have got a 94? So it's the choir that is usually there. Yeah. Those are the type of situations that are very difficult to get people, um, you know, to, to come out, you know, yeah. to. And sometimes being passive and reaching a level of acceptance that this is the way, you know, it, it has been is what's acceptable. Sure. Not that it's acceptable from a school department standpoint, but sometimes that is acceptable <clears throat> at home. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think that your focus here that you, you put on this, this whole dropout, you know, the prevention and intervention, 
I think that the focus is a great stepping stone. So thank you very much. I think that the entire faculty and staff and Mr. Nugent uh, continues to work at it. I think our advisory uh, over time will give us that personalization and education. Sure. You know, our freshmen, when they have the same teacher in advisory for four years, they will know how's Uncle Ben doing because I know last right. spring when you left, he was having surgery. Is that connection? So yeah. Yeah. we're hoping that that is going to make a big difference as well it because should. it is more than just academics. And again, that goes back to those kids that are at risk. If we can find a niche for them, mm -hmm. if we can empower them to lead something that they like and share with other kids, maybe that can be the hook yeah. to keep them here and, and to get them through their high school career. Thank you very much. Mr. Peterson. Uh, I'd like to feed off that too, if I may. You, you brought up something of, uh, earlier as far as uh, I just lost my train of thought. But what, how, where do we stand? Uh, we've grilled the middle school, and we're not really grilling you, hopefully. You're not that uncomfortable tonight, I hope, Mr. Wells. But where, where do we stand as far as the tie-in for our district, starting at a lower level? Are the administrators working together on this so that by the time they get to you? You brought up the point that a lot of our students that we have sometimes problems with haven't been our own and have come here from somewhere else. Um, there's no question about that. What about that. the middle school? Or, uh, how are we working with that in that area so that by the time they get here, they're not looking to drop out? I think that, I think that our ability as an administrative team, uh, that, there, that it is thematic. Uh, for example, I know, Mrs. Daly, uh, that every school was represented in the Wilson Reading Program. And we're talking at the high school about the possibility of sometime in the near future of ha a, having a mandatory writing program for all incoming freshmen. But this would be a program that they were exposed to from the elementary school all the way up. No, so consequently, we are trying, uh, and I think we are effectively beginning to work together as a, uh, certainly as a team. Thank you. Everybody all set with that? Well, thank you again, Mr. Wells, and, and I appreciate your efforts, and, and please keep us updated with how you feel the programs are going, as Mr. Peterson requested, and uh, we'd love to hear your comments, you know, as maybe we hit January. Okay, to absolutely. To let us know how things are going. Absolutely. We'd love Just to hear. two quick uh, last tidbits, since I do have the mic. Uh, one is, you all should have received a copy of a thank you uh, that was sent to Project Coffee. Um, I know, Mr. Spitz, this is uh, uh, a spot that is uh, you're very fond of we can call it the spitz garden but uh i'd like to thank mrs james project coffee and mr hayes as well as the student body for doing an unbelievable job of renovating uh and readjusting our uh our quad uh in between the building uh they spent two two and a half weeks did an amazing job it was really starting to get overgrown they also then went out and they didn't turn the baseball field into Fenway Park, but they did a wonderful job of uh, shaping the lines uh, much clearer, much more distinct. And uh, I just want to thank them because they really did an, a great job. They'll be back in the spring and they'll spread mulch. And uh, as soon as uh, all the snow is gone and the, the birds are chirping, uh, our courtyard will be beautiful again. And lastly, I just wanted to let you know that on this past Friday, uh, we had a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, John Doldorian received a call this summer. He called me, and uh, Dr. Barry Feldman, you have a copy of his bio before you, uh, was able to address our faculty and staff uh, prior to uh, our parent afternoon sessions. And uh, Dr. Feldman is a, the Director of Psychiatry Services and Public Safety and Assistant Professor in Psychiatry at UMass Medical Center, uh, UMass Medical School. But he did address uh, teenage suicide, uh, things that we should look for. Uh, it, was, it was excellent, excellent. Uh, the entire faculty participated, a uh, lot of wonderful Q&A, and uh, it's something that I think that uh, is going to benefit us as a school in terms of watching for signs, symptoms, uh, and, and potential causes uh, for those types of suicidal ideations. So that was good. And on that note, I thank you for your time. And thank you again. Really appreciate your efforts on it. Okay, next on the agenda, we have the approval of the minutes for October 25th for the regular meeting as well as the executive session. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes 
for October 25th. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Can we put this to vote, please? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Peterson? Yes. I vote yes. Thank you. Uh, next, you have in front of you the executive session from the same date, October 25th. Can we have a motion to approve? So moved. Do we have a second? Okay, thank you. Uh, can we put that to vote as well? Yes. 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 And I also vote yes. Thank you very much. Um, in your packets, um, you were given, and this is really for, for your consideration um, as we go through the process here. Uh, oh, he left. Well, thank you. Um, I had asked them to put together for me um, the current salary ranges for the positions we have in the, in the school department, which you have in your packet. We won't really be discussing this tonight. This was an informational thing. We are going to be discussing it probably at the next meeting. Um, so I wanted to give you some time to kind of peruse it and take a look at it. Um, one of the things, and I wish Mr. Himmelberg was still here, um, that I wanted you to pay close attention to when you, when you look at this. Um, this is the salary range that you have on the second sheet that um, was what we established as a, as a committee. Um, presently, on this list, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight that are higher than the, the dollar amounts that we established for these positions, which you can see if you review, if you look at the next administrate the actuals, okay, under FY10. So first of all, we're going to discuss why that happened in the first place, because um, that, that's one thing, and I think I wanted to bring that to your attention as you were looking at this. But then also, um, on the flip side of that coin, um, we've kind of held our administrative salaries pretty much for the last, this will be its third year. Um, and, and I do want the committee um, to, to kind of consider, if they could, if we should adjust these ranges for new hires as well as people that we have currently in position. Um, and I think it is something that needs to get reviewed probably almost each year. Um, and I, I know Mrs. DeWidzik did something with this last year, um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we hit it again this year. So please, if you could, take a look at that. Um, and any questions you have, we'll address them with Mr. Himmelberger when he is um, with us for the next meeting. Okay, in addition to that, um, we're also going to be discussing the F-12 budget on November 29th, the initial... Um, the timelines that are going to be needed for that next upcoming budget. Um, which, Ms. Mr. Mathow, do you have any comments on that as to how the process is going to go? We could just give them some kind of warning yeah. ahead of time. Uh, at the, uh, what we're including in the packet was the memo uh, regarding <coughs> the FY12 budget. The town's um, timeline is included, a copy of the, the cover page was included there as well. Uh, in the past, uh, and certainly last year, I know, because I was here for that last year, um, we submit the, those ancillary budgets, not the main operating budget, in the December time frame, bring forward an operating budget uh, to the committee sometime in January, and pass that on to the town once it's approved by you folks. Um, so at the next meeting, we'll, we just want to bring forward to you the transportation, Medicaid billing, and... Um, crossing guards budgets that have historically been done in this time frame. Um, and then the other information that I included was just a snapshot of, of revenues and where we've been the last couple of fiscal years. Um, again, we're not in a position to talk about the FY12 operating budget tonight or even at the next meeting, but I think it's important that we talk about some, some of this information because it's going to be critical to, develop, to where we go as an administrative team in developing the FY12 budget. All right, great. And a little tie-on to this, Mrs. Ennis, you had mentioned that you'd like to see us invite all committees mm -hmm. to participate in, in a program. This would be the time that we should do this. Mm -hmm. um, is this still something you'd be interested in, well, in having us do? Just to uh, absolutely reiterate that request, definitely. After going to the uh, conference on, at the Cape, we had a couple of speakers that were um, very well versed. They knew the economy. They knew what they were talking about. I, I, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't remember one of the, one of the fellows that spoke was, um, I mean, this is what he does for a living, is he, he's an economic guru, so to speak, and 2012 is going to be the year that is going to hit us harder than we've been hit 
currently. So I think that, and I think that the Board of Selectmen, I'm sure that they understand that, and I'm sure that they're going to feel the same pains, but I think that this is one of those times where you have to sit down together and really put your heads together, do some outside of the box thinking. Um, communication has got to stay wide open for this because if you think that we're in crisis now, I think from what we're going to see in 2012, it's going to be crisis that is going to, um, it could do some serious damage to, to us, to districts surrounding us, and, and to, I mean, I think school districts throughout the country. So I think if they, so I'll you know. I'll contact them and see if we yeah, can put something you, together. Because I think it's Chair a great Casey idea. And, and I think this is, a, this is the time of the year to be yeah, doing definitely. it. Yeah, so. definitely. Yeah. Thank you again for that. Sure. All right, Mr. Mathow, do you have anything else you want to add? That's all for me. Okay, very good. So why don't we hear from uh, Mrs. DeWitzik? I don't. I don't really have anything tonight other than to uh, wish the high school good luck on their Thanksgiving Day game. It's a big one. Um, it's a big one for them. They're very happy. They're very um, successful. And it's great to see a lot of the uh, town come out to support that because that's really a community event. Um, I know everybody over there, the band, the... And JROTC. So it's a great thing to come and see part of school. And um, I'll be in the concession stand again. So come see me. <laughs> That's all I'm I have. sorry. I remember those days. <laughs> you remember days. those I'm days? Sorry. Well, we're still volunteering for well, those. So there you. you go. This is your last year for that, though. You, I don't know. You I just don't keep know. going, yeah. I did for a while, too. So just thank call. you for so that. You go, yep. Mrs. Coonan? I'll come see you. Yes. <laughs> um, Nikki kind of stole my uh, ROTC thunder, but um, past couple of events we've had between the AMI inspection and the first meet Saturday went really well so good good and yes congratulations to all the teams they've had some great games um, and we're looking forward to Thanksgiving excellent mrs. Ennis I am all set this evening thank very you. good mr. Peterson I've got a couple okay um, well mr. Himmelberger left but I guess I'll throw them to you mr. Matthew because he filled them last time and you weren't here, so maybe the two of you can get together and get me an answer, right? Uh, the bleachers out back, that's all I'll say, all right? Um, I understand we had another gas leak. Where do we stand with that situation at Clara Barton? Well, the... It wasn't... No, it was right, a let me preface that. It was... Go ahead. If I may. It was a different valve. So this appears to be the third different area or location that has caused these particular leaks because each time that they've occurred, they've occurred in, in different areas. In, in isn't, there, isn't there a way to test the entire system? Well, yeah. Af after the last um, issue, uh, last April approximately, we, they did test the entire system. Who, who did? Uh, the propane supplier. The office. propane supplier, our supplier, who is working for as, themselves. As, as well as our, the uh, gas slash, uh, yeah, gas inspector. In inspector town. for town. Yeah. So uh, it, it, having gone through that test, it's much like any other mechanical system where individual pieces may be working today but not working tomorrow. Um, that's not a great answer, and it's not, you know, the ideal answer of yes we absolutely know that this will never happen again but I can't sit here and give you that assurance and mr. Danaeus has been involved in this right along right yes my only concern is uh, mr. Matthews you know three strikes and we're out and this is probably not only the third strike there's been some other small minor incidences I'm really concerned about the safety of the staff and the children there as winter sets in and that's usually where you get a lot of your cross drafts your down currents your other and they keep telling us this thing was installed right. Somehow, I can't agree that it is. Can't we get another independent source in here to look at this or something and give us a real definitive if we have to make some changes or something? Someone's going to get sick and hurt there. I'm, I'm concerned. I certainly have no problem going, uh, approaching Mr. Donays and, and seeing if we seeing can get somebody can something. else out, out to us to um, you know, look at that because I agree. It, it certainly is an area of concern. If I may, Mr. Spitz, I would request yeah. that, please, yeah, because I, I just wrote it down. Uh, I, it, it's just somehow I have various houses and various heating systems and things, and um, I just can't buy that. I have gas too. There's got to be something that we are not finding that someone else has to find for us. If I may. Okay. Yep. All right. On that one, um, I'd like to congratulate the R and JROTC also. Again, my apologies. I was at the Cape. We had an excellent conference. Uh, Mrs. Ennis alluded to some of it. And I, I was very, very impressed with the conference and what the association put together again, not because I'm involved with them, but uh, 
There is one speaker that was Friday night speaker that was absolutely phenomenal. And if any of you get the chance, I'm trying to find the name of his book. Uh, I think the name of his bury it's, it's, me yeah, don't bury me across from Burger King, right? <laughs> and it's by Peter Haley. And the reason I bring that up is because it was a, it was a speech, and he's involved with. Uh, uh, we had a lot of nutrition seminars and different things going on there, so the wellness program it fit right into. And uh, again, um, Mr. Wells is a lot gone, but some of us older ones kind of related to more of what Mr. Haley was saying than some of the younger ones. The way this whole mess started and how we all got. And various health problems and things from eating at Burger King all the time, all right? So it, the guy was really good. It's very light, satirical comic. If anybody has a chance, pick up the book somewhere and read it. It's excellent. And the other report I have for you, and I'll give it to you in writing, is the, uh, the um, resolutions. All but one passed out of the seven. Number six did not, and that is the, uh, the intern, the mid-year retirements of teachers. Uh, they felt there were some contractual issues and things still, so that did not, that, that did, was defeated unanimously. The rest all were passed unanimously without any uh, amendments to them, and I'll give you copies of those also. Great, thank you. Again, thank you for uh, letting me attend the conference. Uh, it was jam-packed, but it was very informative on a lot of Well, I consider us lucky that we had two great representatives down there, so thank you both very much for that. Good conference. And Mr. Hummelberger was there, too, uh, part of the time himself. Good. Thursday and Friday. Excellent. <coughs> That's all I have for tonight. You sure? Yep. All right. No, but. <laughs> well, that's why. <laughs> right. That's why I just threw that out. We'll, we'll let it ride. I'm done, Bill. All right. All right. For tonight. And I have nothing for tonight. Uh, I'll open the floor, close the floor. There is no request tonight for executive session. So being there none, um, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Uh, can we have a vote today? Yes. 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 And I also will vote yes. We are now adjourned, and thank you all very much. Thank you. I saw those daggers, Mrs. Delita. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs>